Good morning, everyone. And I, I'm uh, Larimer County Commissioner Joey Shabby McNally, Chair of this Legislative Committee for the uh, Colorado uh, Forest Health Council. I welcome you all and we'll call this meeting to order and take roll call. And Angela, would you mind doing roll call? Yep. Uh, Samantha Albert. Present. Present. Christy Belton. Uh, Katie McGrath Novak, I see you. Present. Pat Dorsey. Present. Matt McCombs. Uh, Commissioner Jody Shaddock McNally. Present. Mark Morgan. Mr. Morgan is the 970 number. Yeah, she's present. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Uh, Julie Stencil. I think Julie had said she wasn't able to make it today. Uh, Council Member White Skunk. All right. <laughs> so we are good and we do have quorum. Thank you so much and appreciate everyone being here. Let me just say, um, how much I appreciate all of you. I know Fridays are busy days and you, we have been having a lot of meetings over the last year and a half or so. And I just I just don't want to um, not take this moment to say I don't take for granted all of your participations and, and all the work that we that we do together. And I want to thank Angela and James and Aunt Courtney and all the staff amazing folks who support us and help us kind of get our minutes together and get all this posted and especially this week before we're going to have the full force health council i just want to express my profound gratitude to all of you and know how much i love this work and love this committee and just appreciate the things that we discuss and work on together so just wanted to i woke up this morning and that was my first thought in my head was how excited I am about this meeting and how much I appreciate all of you. So I just wanted to express that. So with that, are there any changes to the minutes or any um, comments or concerns about the minutes? Okay, with that, I would welcome a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I'll move. Thank you, is there a second? I will second. Thank you, Pat, and thank you, Samantha. So any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, signal by saying aye and maybe raising your hand. Aye. 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 Let's see, Pat Dorsey. Thank you, Pat. And oh, we have Christy Belton. Christy, we just voted on the minutes. You're saying hi too. Okay. So are you voting in approval of the minutes as well, Christy? Okay. I am. I read them. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much and appreciate you being here. So now we'll move on with our I want to honor our presenter Whitney Johnson from the Gates Family Foundation, who is going to do, a, so this is what we're doing today, because this is a big topic. And I know she's going to hopefully come back because we have a lot of information to share. So today, I just want to kind of um, frame this conversation today is just a general overview, because I know they're going to, um, Whitney is off, and thank you, Whitney, so much for your time, is that, that she's offered to come back and um, present a more detailed report that's coming out. But I thought today we would be nice just to have a general overview um, for us to have some of those um, questions. And so I want to just kind of frame that, that this is just the first of two presentations. And I just wanted to kind of make sure you all knew today we're, we're because of time, we have some things at the end we need to talk about. So I just wanted to, um, to frame that. So welcome, Whitney. Thank you for being here. And um, um, please um, um, share with us what you'd like to share. And we're just really excited to have you here today. Okay. Um, well, first I wanna start off by saying thank you for the invitation. Um, and when Courtney and I talked about me joining, um, she first asked about uh, potential policy recommendations from this coalition. And I told her, you know, we're kind of building this thing as we're flying. <laughs> and I told her that what would be great is if I could um, follow up with our coalition and get some ideas to come back to you all with in November. So that's that's the strategy. Yeah. Um, thank you for clarifying that. Yes, yeah, still come yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. Thank and you. I'd love, you know, if we have time, I'd love input from you all on on what you hear today, and if there are things you want me to go back to the coalition with to think about in regards to policy. Um, Please, you know, help guide us, help inform us based on your expertise. Um, so, and my understanding is 15 to 20 minutes. I just want to make sure I'm being careful of yeah. time. Yep. Yeah. And then we'll just have some questions. And then if I have to 
um, cut questions off and we write and send them to you and, yes. and we'll we'll make sure that um, the members of the committee have the opportunity to, and, and we can always table them to the next time. We could send you the yes. question and then you could come back and answer next time. But um, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Thank okay, you. So I'm going to start with a very, very quick and high level overview of what mass timber is, why it matters, and then talk about the coalition. Um, so mass timber is uh, a class of engineered wood products that are that can be made into structural pieces so what's interesting and very relevant to colorado is you can take small diameter wood that typically has you know low value in the in the lumber world and turn it into larger sizes and more diverse shapes um, and you do this by um, taking the small diameter wood and then you can glue it and press it into these structural components that can be used for anything from bridges to high-rise buildings. It includes, you might hear me toss around words like um, CLT or cross-laminated timber, glue lamb, um, MPP, which is mass plywood panels, and nail laminated or dowel la laminated timber. And I got to say, I didn't know any of this before I started down this rabbit hole of the project. So um it's been fascinating so this can be made into large load-bearing structural pieces that are equal to or exceed concrete or steel and therefore replace these mineral-based products so mass timber you know it sequesters carbon generates lower greenhouse gas emissions um and th that leads into why it matters so many are suggesting there's a lot of excitement around mass timber right now as a potential strategy for mitigating the building sector's emissions and um, using it as a tool for forest management and wildfire risk reduction. Um, we know that there's, you know, if you look at population growth and you can see it in Denver and Colorado, there's a huge amount of construction going on. So every day that goes by that we don't convert from these mineral-based construction techniques you know, we're, we're digging ourselves further into a hole. And with mass timber, you can easily invert. So you're sequestering carbon instead of emitting it. And so instead of adding to climate change, you're mitigating climate change. And the, the whole concept is cities could become carbon sinks instead of carbon sources, mm -hmm. and there will be a more robust forest industry. Um, there's a great example of a city in Sweden that they're calling a timber city and they're developing a 25 block part of town all out of timber buildings um, um, and by utilizing timber in a higher value added product you're in increasing the value of the forest and incentivizing investment in forest management watershed health and rural economies so um that's a that's a little bit about the background of mass timber and why we're interested um, before the coalition was a coalition, it was a group of folks who started asking the question, like, could Colorado build an industry to utilize the forests here that are, we all know are in desperate need of thinning and treatment to address wildfire, while also creating um, an end use in the way of mass timber buildings. And what's interesting is Denver and other, other places around the state, um, there are a lot of mass timber. It's a it's a real hot spot for mass timber buildings, um, but all the wood is being trucked in from Canada. <laughs> uh, you know, thirty five hours one way on a on a truck, and some of it's even coming from Europe. Um, so you know, while we're looking at these beautiful buildings going up, we, you know, at the same time are looking at our forests just down the road, and started asking the question, you know, could we position ourselves to be ready for the exponential growth of this industry? Could Colorado accelerate the use of mass timber products in the next generation of buildings? Um, and currently, as we all know, these the timber resources that are being harvested um, in our forest largely have no, you know, they're being left in, in slash piles and burned. Um, so we started having conversations. One conversation led to five more <laughs> and fast forward about a year um, and we've assembled a coalition. We've got probably 
over 70, I think 70 people. We've got an executive committee of about a dozen. And what's great about the coalition is it's everybody along the value chain. So we've got foresters, we've got sawmill operators, we've got economic development folks, conservation groups, architects, engineers, urban planners, all sitting in the same room, which many of them had not done before, um, talking about this, the potential for this. Um, we, early on in the process, um, the consulting group McKinsey and Company got word of this project and they have a Denver presence. And they um, contacted us and pro bono offered like seven of their, of their expert consultants to do a deep dive, a four week, um, they called it a sprint, to look at supply and demand and wildfire risk and manufacturing and milling and workforce and policies. And um, gave us, you know, at the end of that, they gave us a 99 page PowerPoint um, with all kinds of great information. And we use that to pressure test this group of people and say like, should we do this? Can we do this? And as daunting as it is, because <laughs> there are so many things that need to be uh, better understood and worked on all at the same time, everyone agreed that we should try this. So the coalition um, has identified five buckets of work to get smarter about and things that we need to address. And we're, we're sort of doing this all simultaneously. Um, although there are a couple that I'll talk about that are a little bit more downstream, but forest resources. And we're also identifying some um, potential or some uh, leads to kind of lead, lead the work, lead the, the research. Um, so forest resources and leading that bucket of work is the National Forest Foundation and um, Colorado State Forest Service. Um, and that the areas of focus include like resource character, characterization in our Colorado forest. What species are here? What can those species be used for in regards to mass timber? How can we access those trees um, and get it to a sawmill? Um, research into product suitability. Um, then we have demand development. A lot of the demand is happening organically with architects and engineers. Um, Denver has been really progressive. We were one of the first cities in the, in the US to adopt um, building codes addressing mass timber and actually expanding upon the building codes. So Denver has been a real leader there. But the focus there led by, um, we've contracted with RMI, Rocky Mountain Institute, um, is looking at demand activation, um, education and outreach within the like architects, engineers, general contractors, um, looking at public policies and incentives to um, further that growth. Um, and we've got Urban Land Institute, um, Woodworks, Forest Trends, those are some of the partners there. Uh, affordable housing is another interesting application or potential, we're hopeful that it's a potential application for mass timber because mass timber is typically kind of a prefab system. Um, so it's developed offsite and then can be assembled really quickly um, on site. A lot of people are looking to mass timber as a potential solution in the affordable housing world. And Oregon has um, the governor in Oregon has really invested. They they received a, an EDA, a Build Back Better grant, um, multi-million dollar grant to develop um, an affordable housing manufacturing this site campus there. Um, so we've got a group here that is interested in that, um, led by the Neighborhood Development Collaborative, people like the Urban Land Conservancy, um, Urban Land Institute um, and some other affordable home builders are a part of that group. Um, then we have workforce, which comes up in every conversation, whether it's, you know, the trees coming out of the, the forest to the actual building of, of homes and buildings. Um, we don't have a lead identified. That's workforce and the manufacturing and milling. Um, 
work buckets are a little bit less developed. So workforce, we're having conversations with people. I'd be very open to hearing from you all in any follow-ups about some, some workforce people that we should be talking to. Um, but we know that we need to identify the, the needs, the challenges and the opportunities there. And then manufacturing and milling. And we had actually have a pretty robust group of current sawmill operators in the state that would be that are very excited and interested in expanding their capacity um, but we're also we also know we're going to need to do some business case studies about the different models out there so some people have talked about a more regional model you know within a 50 mile radius you could set up smaller plants and then some have said i've argued you need scale and you need a big facility along the i-70 i-25 corridor with access to you know trains and um and the and the big highway infrastructure um i'll also note just as there have been some really interesting conversations about the just transition communities in colorado and specifically in hayden where they're converting um potentially converting a coal plant into a biomass facility and so a lot of people have been chattering about could there be a wood campus there where you know the fiber that's coming out of the the forest there some of it goes to the biomass facility some of it gets diverted to a mass timber uh, manufacturer um so that's kind of the short and the sweet uh, of this i think it's exciting to think about buildings and towns um driving the demand for timber and and helping to stabilize and improve soils and and improve our forests and um I, in regards to policy so um what i'm going to do is send out an email to our coalition and kind of crowdsource um some ideas i know that there are some people already working on some policy things like i mentioned our our building codes. We have an expert here in Denver that's um, always advancing the next level of building codes. We and we have some great examples that we're looking at. If you if you want to see some a really interesting uh, plan, which I can send as a follow up, it's a British Columbia Action Plan. It's part of their economic strategy. They have an entire economic um, report and office that is focused on mass timber as a driver um, for their economy and for their natural resources. And that was developed about three years ago, and they've already exceeded um, buildings being built uh, compared to the entire US just in that provenance. They have, you know, they're just going gangbusters. Um, we also know there's some great, you know, in terms of regulatory, there's some green procurement policies. Um, accounting for greenhouse gas emissions in bidding processes for public financed buildings, um, incentives and in programs to stimulate research and development. There's economic tools like incentives and subsidies. Um, our next executive committee meeting, actually, we're going to have the Oregon Department of Forestry and Willamette National Forest. They have figured out how to do federal forest restoration projects in support of mass timber manufacturing. So we're gonna see what kind of policies they have used to do that. Um, but also curious, you know, as a follow-up or in the Q&A, if you have ideas that I should flag for our group, that would be great. And then the last thing I wanna say is on November 6th, from three to five, the coalition is gonna, is invited to tour um, a mass timber structure that's a, a new, DPS school um, and we're going to tour the um, the building. Actually, I think it's a gymnasium that is going to be a, a mass timber um, structure. And so the the contractors are um, going to give us a tour and then we're going to do a happy hour. <laughs> so if anybody wants to join, I extend that to everybody here. Thank you so much, Whitney. And that's exciting to hear. And um, I guess when we talk about policy and stuff, we don't um, you know, we're trying to think about forest health and how what we're looking at and workforce is definitely one thing we've tackled. And so um, I'm not sure um, 
Well, it'd just be interesting to hear about all of it. So we'll, I know we try and stay high level and we appreciate you crowdsourcing some ideas, but I will see if anyone has any questions for you at this time. Raise your hands and Samantha, and then um, and then Christy would like to know if you could have your contact info. Samantha. Yeah, thanks, Judy, and thank you, Whitney. I um, It's exciting to hear this. I, I feel like I heard you speak at another group, but um, I, I'm sorry if I missed this. Did you say that you're all connected at all with like the OEdit housing work? Yes. Okay. Um, Jack, is it Jack? Yeah. He reached out to me. We've, we presented to Jeff. Well, Jeff Kraft is on our executive committee and he brought in like a lot of people from his team to hear about it. And Jack actually is going to be on the tour and um, just let me know that they're supporting through the, what's it called? The IHIP, the, yeah, housing yeah. innovation they're supporting we actually colorado does have one uh mass timber manufacturer and in durango and that that program just supported that group um okay. with its most recent round of things awesome i figured yeah. you were connected but just wanted to check thanks yes i'm trying to okay yeah i'm going to enter my contact info so Whitney, um, thanks. I've been trying to, you've <laughs> been trying to get together in person for a while. I haven't done it. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you, has there been any conversation about, and there certainly wouldn't be for a while, but do we have enough wood in Colorado if we start talking about bioenergy and mass timber? And personally, I'm a big fan of mass timber. I just was curious if that's seen as a barrier at all. No, from the conversations we've had and the McKinsey research that was done and conversations, and I mean with like Matt McCombs, who you all know very well, um, and the National Forest Foundation who did, actually they were contracted by Excel to do a hundred mile radius, um, looking at the fiber supply in just that area around Hayden. And, um, we have heard over and over again and the research has shown that that is not an issue and matt always brings up to thinking about this as more than colorado as like a regional um approach thank you for that question pat mr morgan mr mark again i get to have you have off mute there thanks mark We're still not off mute. Angela, do you have any powers over that? I don't believe I do, unfortunately. How about now? Oh, there we there go. We go. Great. Very good, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, one question is, <clears throat> I'm a little bit familiar with mass timber technology. And uh, one of the beauties of it is, is that you can use varying grades of fiber, but one of the big misconceptions that you need to be very careful about is that diameter is oftentimes not the limiting factor, the size of the timber. We have quite a few uses in Colorado for small diameter wood. It comes down to the quality of the wood. So uh, uh, a lot of the wood that we need to do fuels work with is of pretty low, low grade quality of wood. It's not so much the diameter, and I hope that some of your specialists are looking at the, the diameter oftentimes is not the limiting factor. You have yeah. manufacturing facilities in the state that go down to four inches and four and a half inches and some even smaller than that. But you need to be looking at, like, for example, a lot of the fuels work that you're trying to do is in front range ponderosa pine, and you have... Uh, you have a lot of quality issues there. One of the advantages of mass timber is that you tend to you tend to uh, spread the weaker sections of wood over a larger panel. It's the same idea as making plywood when you make plywood or particle board. So you you tend to limit those, which is a positive thing about it. But uh, I would hope that some of your supply people are looking at the difference you're talking you see a lot of success in in oregon and washington and british columbia and that is they have a lot of small diameter wood that they're trying to deal with but by and large it's very high quality wood yeah are you familiar also with 
just a suggestion. I believe it's British Columbia. Just they opened up a new facility and they participated there. There was some uh, there was some governmental participation in building a new seventy five million dollar plant there. Yeah. And the thing about it is they have in Colorado here. We have a lot of low grade, poor quality ponderosa pine timber. Mm -hmm. We also have a fair amount of really small diameter lodgepole pine timber. Yeah. The lodgepole pine timber very much, co in fact, it's the same species with a lot of what's in northern Canada. So, you know, there is a comparison there that you might want to look at. Yeah. Okay. And then one other suggestion would be if anybody in your coalition is looking at uh, one of the biggest users. You know, we're looking at supposedly a CO2 problem. Well, a young, vibrant, growing forest uses way more CO2 than a decade and older forest. And yeah. Photosynthesis still works and you get conversion here. Yeah. So, uh, just, I, I would hope that they would be looking with the array of experts that you were telling us about. Do you have anybody looking at the quality side of the timber? Yeah, that is going to be one of our um, focus areas. So the Colorado State Forest Service, I think, is going to be a big resource for that. Um, and they're coming out with their biomass study, I think, soon. I hope soon. Um, but we know, and there's a rigorous certification process for, you know, for this, for mass timber. So it's a big question and it's something we have on our to-do list <laughs> i just want the timber that we need to get rid of to match up with what you're going to put in a mass timber building yep thank you thank you thank you for your questions mr morgan anyone else have um any questions um before we let whitney um continue with her day we just really appreciate you coming here oh director mccombs you know, I just want to say how much we appreciate the Gates Family Foundation stepping into the breach here and really uh, kickstarting a really valuable, important conversation. Uh, it, we would not be as far as we are in this conversation and been taking a serious approach uh, without um, Tom and Whitney's leadership and willing to, to take on a very challenging question, uh, mm -hmm. but we're deeply uh, committed and, and we feel like we have great potential. So thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, I echo those um, those comments, Director McCombs. I, when if we first had this presentation and heard about this, it's almost like a um, a sigh of relief, like oh wow, we have some great partners to help yeah. us kind of tackle this large issue. And I'm yeah. super excited to hear about all the work, and we just really appreciate you being here today. And I really um, learned trying to ask more questions and learn more as I can. And we just wanted to say we I think we're all very excited to hear about this work and looking forward to you coming back and, and presenting some ideas and and really thankful for um, you and, and and your team and, and Bill and, uh, the Gates Family Foundation being involved. We're just super, super um, excited for the partnerships and the collaboration and all the coalition you're pulling together. I think this is um, transformational. Um, is the word I think this is going to be transformational for, for our region, I think. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks for all the work you're doing here on the council. Well, we appreciate you're welcome to hang out and listen to our discussions or we'll just um, it's up to you what you'd like to do. But we just thank you for your time and the presentation yeah. today. And we'll look forward um, to having you come back in a few weeks. And, and yeah. uh, I know Courtney's got that lined up. So just say thank yeah. you. And I just I'll send Courtney a couple thought like the British Columbia action plan I referenced and an invitation to that um, tour if anybody wants to come. That would be fantastic. Appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye. Well, thank, you. Um, thank you again. This has been fantastic. Okay. So um, thank you all for great questions. Um, and now we'll move on to our next item. We have um, a continued discussion on the Wildfire Matters Review Committee talking about uh, County slash days and Director McComb is going to share some progress on that and which where it's kind of landing and what that looks like. Thank you, Director McCombs. Yeah, so just an update for this body. Um, you know, I would say from a high level, one of the really positive things is that we're starting this session. Um, the agencies are just doing a fantastic job of coming together 
uh, to to try to provide sort of a unified front, unified feedback on on the bills to make sure that they're as um, as good as they can be. And so, uh, DNR, DFPC, and State Forest Service have been meeting and will continue to meet to to come up with ideas on how and where. You know, I think the slash bill in particular was one where you know we were having conversations about where should that um, potential potential program be seated. Uh, and so, you know, we want the the right people doing the right thing. So that's part of that conversation, but really um, just trying to come up with a joint strategy on how we'll engage the sponsors and how we'll engage um, other interested stakeholders to make sure that we're providing as much of a, a unified message on how we think we can craft these bills and help shape these bills to be super impactful and, and meeting the exacting needs that we have right now. So that's that's about as far as it goes. So I think um, as far as the conversations you know, right now, we're just trying to kind of get everybody in line so that James uh, and Daphne and, and Joel over at, at uh, DFPC, their alleged liaison can um, continue to just sort of work together and make sure that the, the messaging that the assembly's hearing is, is a, a unified message from all of us. And if there's specific questions, we can certainly get into that and I'll lean on Angela to help me make sure I'm representing what these larger group discussions have been um, yielding. Thanks, Director McCombs. Angela, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think the only thing, so um, quick update on Wildfire Matters Review Committee. I believe it's on Halloween that they meet next. I might be wrong about that, so I should check, but um, October 30th, I think they will vote on the five uh, draft bills that they advance as a committee. Um, now, of course, if a bill does not get advanced through the committee, there's still an opportunity for an individual member to, you know, move that bill forward. So um, these concepts may not die if they don't make it through committee, but just an update there. <clears throat> so we can share around uh, that, you know, committee information, the, the sort of information to listen in so that folks can do that. Um, you know, I think the only questions we had on the slash date bill um, if it does move forward, um, Jody, I think especially from you, we would just love if you have any further clarification on sort of the vision that you have for that program. Um, I think we have an opportunity to just discuss that today. You know, the the bill draft that came out is is fairly simple in the sense that basically just direct directs folks and actually directs DNR, but I think we're going to push for it to be in the State Forest Service. Um, you know, to develop uh, this pilot program. Um, and it sort of talks about providing technical assistance to counties, you know, to develop their slash day pilot projects or programs. Um, it talks about resources, but it's not very specific in terms of whether that's providing grant funding or what. So um, I suppose I just wanted to create some space today. If there, if there are more specifics that you were thinking about when you made this recommendation, um, just to share them with us. And obviously as, as things move forward, we can have sort of more detailed conversations about potential amendments, et cetera. But um, yeah, I just wanted to open that conversation um, because the, yeah, the bill draft is pretty simple. Um, thanks, um, Angela. I'll let Mr. Morgan, um, he's got his hand raised and then I'll try to answer that. Thanks. I had just one real quick comment. Director McCombs, thank you. You're the right person at the right time in this endeavor that we have going on right now. We need our federal partners, but I find that they are generally, and this is not to be negative, that they're reactionary. Problems get to be a problem and then they look for solutions. And we need somebody that is proactive. And I really appreciate the leadership role you've been taking in this because it does develop a, a momentum and we need that desperately. And, and I think you're the right person for the job and thank you very much. I just wanted well, to get, that's important. Thanks, Some leadership. I, I appreciate that though. That's, I appreciate the vote of confidence. Um, and we are, we really are trying to be progressively minded, right? Like like anticipating the future that's in front of us and, and, and moving towards it as opposed to the alternative, which is, yeah, responding to, to trauma and, and, and tragedy. So um, thanks for that, appreciate it. I echo Steve, those comments. Thank real, you. Real quick, we can't yeah. do. It, by the way, I mean that actually. I mean, just we do get caught up, right? Sometimes and 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 just making sure we all know how we we feel about each other. But I want you all to know that, like the stakeholder group uh, that this group represents, as well as the larger Forest Health Council. I mean, it also 
it's critically important for, frankly, for leaders like myself and for Dan and for Mike and others, like to have the confidence uh, of y'all. And, and so that it really does mean a lot because there's risk uh, in, in saying what you think is right and trying to move things in a direction that perhaps not everybody's ready for. So um, I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, Director McCombs. I think um, Mr. Morgan, I agree with those. I just feel um, very fortunate to um, be a part of this at this time. We have some great leadership and some great um, collaboration and seeing all these departments kind of united and standing shoulder to shoulder at this time is really inspiring and um, uplifting. And so to Angela's question, um, you know, uh, I know I kind of suggested this. I was always, I guess my my I see other counties doing some um, programs that are united and supportive. Like I think about Jefferson County, they have slash days and they actually provide these roll away bins or bring industry in to, so that people have these slash days and then they get it off the landscape. And my hope was that if we had this and let counties kind of have incentives or private partners, um, like maybe Mr. Morgan's the company gets an incentive to come and show up in, a, in a, a region or an area where people bring, put them maybe in their neighborhoods at the bottom of the hill or or the neighborhood where everyone's bringing their slash or whatever areas that um, we could have this uh, proof of concept or something that we could have also local areas and governments um, find solutions for wooded biomass and how, how we can bring private partners um, neighborhoods, local governments, and nonprofit agencies all to focus on one day to to help with slash programs and then bring it off the landscape. I know I got reached out even by my staff like, hey, we don't need more piles on the on the slash days. We don't need more piles. Um, but I, I I that's not the idea. It's just how can we um, bring this together and either um, provide and uh, financial or support incentives for some of these smaller counties that maybe not have this great collaboration, but also how, like my community, um, we have some slashes, but if we didn't provide some of the dumpsters or some of the support to get it off the landscape, it would stay there. Even like cleaning up after um, the black um, hollow debris flow, we had $7 million worth of debris to remove, right? And so we found a way to kind of recycle that rock and that timber there and get it off of out of the river and put it in other ways. And then we provide dumpsters to have people come up and down for one day to clean things up along the river and get the wood. And we got it into appropriate bins and got it out. And so that's kind of where my thought is and whether it's um, incentivizing um, our, our, our partners to come in, um, to have everyone come together on one big day. We have a slash yard and that's in actually Larimer County, but it's run by Boulder County. And um, I don't know if you can still hear me, my computer's loading several pages. Um, and, they, and people up in that area, they bring it to that slash yard. And we've had to build a partnership with Boulder County for the, you know, trying to help because they're running their program in our county, but it's for that whole region that's way up there. And that's where everyone brings their slash. And then the thought of not having that, neighbors in the whole valley, very long valley, kind of come up in arms like, we need this. This is how we keep our landscape safe. So, um, but that's a whole operation um, in, in collaboration. So that's, I don't have details like exactly like this. I just thought this was a way to somehow organize and incentivize how local communities work because what works for um, Jefferson County is probably different than La Plata or maybe even up in Jackson, but Jackson may not have the partners and resources, but maybe if we had something closer to the Larimer County Jackson border for those really remote neighborhoods um, for let private landowners or um, things like that. So that was my my thought was just how could we, since we're having this big massive discussion on woody biomass and my, my staff have, I mean, that's all they talk about right now is <laughs> how do we get all this, but how we deal with this, we don't want to keep burning piles. And we, and as I said, we're looking at this with our new landfill and, and emerging technologies, how it's, it's all these programs for helping people do defensible spaces, but how do we, um, 
how do we maybe show there might be something that bubbles up out of this to show how at a small scale we could scale up something by something that happened locally so i hope that i don't know if that um makes sense you know i i suggest it's judge of this because sometimes some new and different ideas come out of folks coming together and kind of in situations to figure out something to do and it's it's on a small scale but maybe it would bring and spark some ideas of how we can do this at a larger scale or coordinate and just and also i think it's a, a tremendous opportunity to continue to raise the awareness and keep this important work um, in front of the public and in front of local governments because you know we kind of haven't had anything thank goodness this year um, at a large scale and I don't want people to forget the risk or the need or that the, the we're at a historical crossroads I feel right now where there's federal funding and all this opportunity in the Gates Foundation and how to use this also to keep our whole region focused on the work that we need to do and at the scale we need to do in this in this area to prove um, for their, our forest health and for the safety and welfare of our watersheds and our communities. So long, long answer there. I hope that helped. Mr. Morgan, I see your hands raised. Yes. Uh, I heard my name being called before I even heard my name being called. I was getting a little echo in the wind there. So uh, several real quick comments. First one is, uh, I think the greatest value of what you're talking about might be the PR side of things to give it in front of the public to realize that they need to do something. I think it's more important to sell forestry than it is to sell the ultimate use of the material, number one. Another one that you grasped very honestly there was timber supply comes in what we call a timber basket or a working area. So it may not be a county boundary or it may not even be a state boundary, but uh, you, you, it's a transportation thing. And so I think being aware of that is very important. For example, as I mentioned, the northern end of your county is uh, northwest end of it is an important part of like Saratoga, Wyoming's timber basket. So there's it reaches across. Uh, I think that uh, there is a great number of companies private companies, entities that already do what you're talking about and, and they're trying to, and so I think it's possible, you know, I would consider a, a grinding day or a slash disposal day to help sell forestry here in Larimer County. Or I think that uh, one of the biggest problems that we have, the two problems are, it isn't so much the grinding or it isn't so much the utilization or the chipping. The real problem is the quality of the material that you get because in all the machinery that you use to do this any kind of uh, contamination of the material is a real problem so when people tend to put stuff in dumpsters and everything you get nails rocks pieces of metal uh, we've gotten when we try to take material from the public we got truck truck bumpers and pieces of car spring and and one of those does about fifteen thousand dollars of damage in the blink of an eye so keeping track of the, the feedstock that you're asking the public to bring is a huge item and if you get a good clean residue stream the other thing is that many of the products that we tend to build are or make are actually chemically very dependent so People start throwing old lumber in there and it's got paint in it. We've got a real problem if we're making water filtration material for one of the water plants. And so really the quality of the material is huge and, and the transportation. I mean, I would individually for my company, I would be more than try, helpful to try to help you get a grind day or a slash day. But the real big ones that you have to overcome is contamination of material and and the transportation side of it. Other than that, at least for one pilot program that you would like to do, Commissioner, all right, I raised my hand, I'll help, I will do that. But uh, uh, those are the, the, those. that's what I'm gonna be watching with an eagle eye, the questions that I just gave you, so.
No, and I think those are great points. Um, I think um, that was one thing I saw with the Jefferson County slash days. They have a very robust um, section about what does not go in and what does not, <laughs> what they are looking for. And so I think that also is a great opportunity to um, to educate folks. And I think you're right. It could it could be costly for some of those, as you, as you have shared with me. And then I also, when I visited, um, some of the Lamar County Conservation District's work and uh, talking about how much just that one of those pieces cost to fix. Um, they had something come through and so um, just was astounded how much that cost and then to move it off the landscape to go get it fixed or bring it up was several thousand dollars. So it was it was a good, good uh, education piece for me as well. So um, no, I just um, for me, it was kind of just seeing what we could bring together, help continue to educate folks, but also um, spur some maybe innovation. So just at a small scale that maybe might help large scale. So does, I hope that helps Angela. Mr. Morgan. One other quick comment. Don't overlook, there are, uh, it's kind of like the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. You have many partners in industry right now in your communities that already do this and they move an incredible amount of material already. So you also got to, when you craft your solution, uh, there are several large biomass recyclers and stuff and uh, that already exist. So that's one other thought. I mean, you're going down the right path. You got, you got me to agree, but you have to, there are other partners out there that are in business and do this for a living and you don't want to harm them. Great point. And maybe that's um, some very important groups um, to have at the stakeholder table and maybe get some ideas or suggestions from them. So that's a great point. And maybe that's something um, I can suggest or maybe collect some of that information. So, um, and thanks, Pat. I appreciate you sharing that link. Um, cool. Great. I appreciate you um, showing that. That's a great um, information. Appreciate you sharing that information. I don't know if everyone saw she shared a um, a good link. So, okay. Any other, I want to look at our time. Any other questions on that? I hope that helps a little bit. Angela. Um, and director, I know director Combs was been looking at this as well. Yeah, okay, so helpful, and we'll obviously keep <clears throat> folks updated once we see what moves through the committee. That, that's what I was going to say. Is we'll we'll keep meeting as agencies and certainly try to keep folks aware of, of what feedback we're providing, so that can be juxtaposed against what this stakeholder group wants to uh, continue to provide input. In. Awesome. Okay, um, so let's move on. We're about eleven minutes out, so want to be aware of the time. Um, the next thing on our agenda is uh, kind of refining some of the topics um, for um, our upcoming um, speakers. And then I wanted to talk real quick um, about our schedule because we're a little, actually, if you look at our backwards planning, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. And I know um, there sounds like there's some potential, including me, some potential um, with the holidays coming up, but also uh, I will be out of, of town on the third. And so we're just kind of looking for that. So um, Angela, I think you were going to help refine some of those topics or ask some important questions. Yeah, thanks, Jody. Um, so if you all remember last month, we spoke about, you know, the topics that people would like to hear about. We made some progress on that. So I think we are looking at December um, to get both Director Gibbs on to talk about the Federal Fire Commission recommendations. Um, you know, I I can't remember, I don't know if we sent them around, maybe we'll send them around before next week's meeting, but that Federal Commission came out with 148 recommendations. So Director Gibbs can highlight, I think, the most important points for us. Um, we're still nailing down those dates, but he'll probably be available. I think it's either December 1st or the 15th um, if, if we're going to hold those meetings. Same question to Director Morgan. Uh, we asked him if he could come on to provide maybe a more in-depth presentation on the prescribed fire subcommittee um, and sort of strategy. I know a couple of you may be engaged in that and could contribute to that conversation. Um, so we're trying to get them on deck. 
Um, just looking at our notes, you know, obviously we had uh, an update today from the Gates Family Foundation and are looking to have them come back in November to have a um, more substantive conversation with us about potential policy recommendations. Um, and then a couple other items here, you know, folks were interested in having that prescribed fire update, but then specifically speaking to the insurance piece, um, I think we can get easily get a couple of folks who are thinking a lot about that. Um, and then uh, uh, Mark Morgan, you were interested in um, getting a speaker to discuss exactly how much biomass can or should be left on the landscape. My idea for that was actually Brett Wolk, who's our council member, and he may have a colleague he wants to bring on as well, but they helped publish uh, this sort of mulching guidance, which is basically a guidance for, you know, slash and chip depth uh, in various forest types. And I think he'd be happy to present on that. So these are the items that we're lining up. Um, really, I think we can just open it up to see uh, if anybody, you know, wants to say, hey, I think we should discuss this topic next. Um, but Jody, it also might make sense if I know you wanted to cancel a meeting or two, if perhaps we think about the calendar and, and get that out of the way too. Well, oh, my, my um my thoughts were for the council because we really don't have we've been talking about a lot of these things and we have the forest health council full forest health council next week and then the next meeting would be on the third and i thought just to give staff kind of a chance to get these speakers lined up um, it doesn't sound like anyone can come until probably the 17th anyway as speakers um, and, and that's when whitney is coming back so i was hoping um you all might consider just us um so we have the full force health council so it would just be skipping the third and then we would have that meeting on the 17th would be our next meeting when whitney would come back and then we would have um the full recommendations um from the um that would give almost um you know a little over a week for the full recommendations from the um wildfire interim committee and we can kind of have those um ready to present instead of just a couple of days we'd have a little bit more formed um um, presentation about that and so I just thought that was kind of my suggestion and I had been talking with Courtney and, and thinking about when the speakers were available with their schedules so unless everyone anyone has a strong um, uh, comment on that I was wondering if, if we would um, what your thoughts were and if you supported that thought was that plan I'm not sure. I don't see any hands up or I don't see any nodding. <laughs> Sounds good to me, Jenny. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Um, just want to kind of, um, okay. Okay. So it sounds like I have a majority. Is anyone opposed to that plan? Okay. So um, I don't know if we need to take a vote on that, Angela, or just, is that just a kind of a general planning thing that we can um, go forward on? Yep, I think that's sufficient. My only other question would be, um, in addition to these topics, are there any topics that folks really want, you know, to have an expert come in and discuss? Uh, it'll just help us line them up sort of sooner rather than later. Samantha. Yeah, Angela, my only thought, um, having, I think I shared this maybe a couple months ago, is maybe having someone present from the Colorado Outdoor Strategy. So it'd probably be Keystone Policy Center. Great, thank you, Samantha. Um, and that's timely, actually. I just had a conversation with Julie Shapiro earlier this week, and um, I think we may actually have her come present at the Full Forest Health Council in January. Um, you know, I think we just agreed it would be worthwhile to have the full council aware of what's going on there. You know, I think um, obviously wildfire and and just forest management more generally looms large here in the council and and we don't necessarily talk about wildlife and recreation um you know as much as some other topics and so i think it could make sense to to have her and really open up those conversations a little bit more i think i think that's an excellent su uh, suggestion i see that katie has her hand raised thanks for that suggestion samantha katie yeah i really like that suggestion as well and then um i was also just gonna say i would like to host another listening session with forest collaboratives around colorado um i'm thinking probably <clears throat> sometime early next year like maybe before a full council meeting so i could give like a short update there but then i think 
um, I would really like to give a longer set of recommendations to this committee and maybe leveraging resources as well, whatever we think is most relevant. But um, I'd like to volunteer for that if people are interested. I think that would be great to hear from the forest collaboratives and, and get some feedbacks if you're, you, it sounds like you're um, having a larger listening session. I think that would be great to hear from all of them. So we can put that towards maybe, you said in January, so maybe we look at that, putting that um, later on in, um, we'll, we'll just put it on the list and we can figure out this timing later. So. Yeah, just sometime early next year. No, no okay. huge rush on that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Katie. So we're almost out of time. So we have Mr. Morgan or Pat Dorsey and then Mr. Morgan. And I don't know who was other hand raised. Go ahead, Pat. I was just going to ask, um, is there, you know, we hear a lot about large trees store more carbon, but younger trees store or, or you know, sequester carbon a whole lot faster, that kind of thing. Is there someone that could talk about forest age structure and how that relates to forest management and carbon storage? Be great. Yes, I imagine Ashley Woolman um, from State Forest Service, she's their forest carbon specialist, would be able to answer some of those questions. And um, she also might know other folks who should maybe join. So I can note that down. Okay. And now I think uh, Christy or Mr. Morgan or Christy, I don't remember who was first, but, but we're almost out of time. Go ahead, Christy. Um, I'm just typing mine in chat. So if you want to go ahead, I'll, I'll just finish up my typing. The reason I suggested the topic that I did about how much forest biomass could be left on the ground, because uh, you use fossil fuel resources every time you transport products. So the more stuff you transport and try to take out or move, then you, you're essentially burning diesel and to transport this stuff and transport of forest products is half of your forest harvesting operations that you do so i think at some point if we're going to operate on a scale and we need to operate on a large scale i think we need to take there needs to be a a production uh mechanical side to the material that we left on the ground not just an automatic optimum scientific level there, there needs to be some trade-offs there I think there's going to need to be a compromise found. You can take the scientific side of it and say that 1.7 inches is the ideal amount of material left on the ground, but that may be more than offset by a lot of other considerations, transportation, safety, uh, production costs, fossil fuel uses. I think there needs to be another half to what I was asking there. Thank okay. You. Um, Christy, did you get it typed in? And you want we have like thirty seconds left just to be in compliance with the policy. So, do you have a, you want to just state real quick or? Sure, um, oh, I sent it. And basically, just if we can have somebody present to us on the benefits of uh, grazing and the positive impacts to um, forest health, that that would be great. I've been working on it, but I just have not had any luck getting this guy to call me back. Okay, and then also would love to add beavers. I just saw a great presentation on some of the work and having beavers um, sure. up in. That would be great. Okay, so with that, we're at 930. Um, great meeting. Thank you all for your ideas. Um, and uh, we can work um, on furthest and 17th. So um, we'll see you on the 17th. We'll get that agenda. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, I would love to have a motion to adjourn. So move. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for Angela for all the support today, and have a great weekend and happy Halloween. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks. thanks, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. So I just didn't know if you wanted to um, talk for a second and see what else I need to help um, with. Oh, yeah. Um, good question. So, I mean, I think if we're taking the third off, um, we're pretty good that way. Um, I will say for next week's meeting, um, you know, uh, and I'll forward, I think the agenda was sent around maybe yesterday, but uh, there are committee updates. Mm -hmm. And let me just look at the agenda again. Um, because it, I would, 
I think as part of your update, we should just do a quick rundown of the Wildfire Matters Review Committee bills. Um, but I am happy to do that if, if you know, there obviously there are a lot of them I know, and we also don't know which ones are going to be advanced. Um, I don't mind doing that if you can just give me the list and then I can, you know, then I can just kind of run through them and say, and we, we won't know till the 31st, but then I can kick it to you saying, hey, what else would you like to add or something? Just to okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, and we might also have just a quick discussion around how the legislative committee will function during the ledge session because the ledge session will start before our next full council meeting. Um, thankfully, we have that charter we put together last year that Courtney sent around again. Um, so, you know, I, you or I can sort of review the high points of that, um, just sort of get everybody on the same page with how things are going to operate. So, and I think we changed that so that if their bills come out and then get amendments and that we would send reports and if there, there was the, the unanimous vote that we would end up supporting the amendments. That's kind of what you were looking to kind of highlight. Yeah, I think so. I'll review it and I can send you the high level points. Um, I'm trying to just trying. there's some like sort of procedural, you know, details. I, there's something about if there isn't consensus on maybe it's if there's not consensus consensus on an amendment within the committee, then it has to go to the full council and maybe an emergency meeting to approve, you know, support for an amendment. So anyway, I'll send that around. No, I think that's good to know. And I, I think we gave out two reports this year. And I don't think we ever got any feedback on those. Right. So it'd be great to just ask, did you find that helpful? Did you read it? Did you have any concerns? Was this, you know, I think that would be great just to, since that was requested by the full council to see if that was what they were looking for. So, um, I mean, I don't, unless you heard response, I don't think we had, other than thank you, I don't think we had any um, pushback or questions, correct? No, I don't think so. Um, and I would imagine that will be the same this year, but it'll be interesting. There are a lot of bills. So if, you know, obviously five will advance through wildfire matters. If individual members bring the remaining bills, there could be like more than 10 forestry related bills again in this session. Um, so it just could be busy. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. Um, you know, if that's not the five, then who else is doing, you know, what? Um, and that was the reason why was my question was if it doesn't make the interim, are any of these bills going to get, you know, because we had recommendations, are any of these going to get picked up or do we have, you know, do we, and then do we go, are we able to go out and support those? If they're not, the, so that's another question I wanted to have clarified. Are we only able to advocate and support? I mean, I know we'd supported some of the DNR bills and the nursery bill. But just to clarify, we have the wildfire interim recommendations, but there's these other bills. So maybe just to refresh everyone that we might have to take a vote on supporting these other bills. Is that what you're thinking? Perhaps, you know, I think, um, you, so we might, it depends. Like some of the some of the bills, if they don't make it through wildfire matters, but then an individual member introduces them, if they're based on a concept that we already recommended, uh, that's, that's fine. I think we can go forth and support them, even though they're, Come, like coming through a different process, that's fine. Um, but I think some of the others, maybe that the council did not uh, recommend, um, we would have to have, I think, a separate conversation about an official council position. Yeah, because I don't think there's some of those that um, are coming out that I know my, you know, I'm going to probably have to, um, my, um, my team, my staff have raised some concerns. Yeah. And so I'll have to be very careful about, you know, um, you know, what I'm, we just have concerns about the details, not about the overall concept, but just some of the details. Right. And, um, and so I think um, this is going to be interesting um, this session because, you know, before we had such a clear, like these two bills we really want to support and this one, it feels um, and I and I feel I guess I want to ask if feel a little pushback. I mean, I suggested this idea. I really didn't think it would get picked up. Be honest with you. I just was trying to see how we could support locals trying to do some more of this work because I know we don't have a really a slash day. We mm -hmm. have programs to go out. I know Jefferson County does, but how can we get everyone kind of doing this on a day and kind of raise this awareness? But also, I'm thinking sometimes when you kind of push people to do something on a certain day, it might force innovation or something that could so that was my idea um, yeah. obviously 
so I'm, I'm, I don't, didn't mean to cause so much um, angst. Sometimes I feel like I'm feeling angst about this. Um, I know it's probably happening in pockets, but maybe this is a way to highlight it too. And maybe this is help. I know it's a smaller scale, but it might help regionally advance something. And I, and I do think um, this year it feels like wildfire matters and some of this work is starting to not be in the forefront of people's minds. And I would, I just like to, to keep it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope, I, I hope I hope you don't perceive any pushback from the agencies on it. Um, we don't think we think it's a, a good idea. It's more a question of what do the details look like? Because, um, you know, the details of the program uh, that just dictates like how we fill out fiscal notes, for example, you know, how we yeah. estimate how much that program might cost, et cetera. So that's that's why we're probing a little bit, just trying to ensure that we um, we understand the original intentions. So I think, you know, like um, Director Morgan or um, Mr. Morgan brought up, um, like if the industry is going to come, diesel fuel is costly. Do we incentivize them to come and, you know, they're using maybe bringing their commitment for, for free, but maybe we cover the cost of fuel or cost of, you know, pulling it out um, and, you know, having, um, neighborhoods or local governments maybe they need to provide money for that day for uh advertisement or flyers or food for the day to get people to come together and connect i think this also overlaps with this whole concept we're hearing um in other areas across the state about social connectedness and there's a lot of talk about bringing um i think denver's talking about have a hundred house or neighborhood parties to bring neighbors together, connect for social isolation and things, and sometimes in the unincorporated areas, um, that you don't have like parties like that, but you can bring together for people for a mission. And I was thinking about when I traveled up in the retreat in my neighborhood, and they were after the fire, and they were trying to quickly help some of these older folks. Um, properties that that burned down, but they had all these dead trees, and they were trying to. The whole neighborhood showed up. 50 people to help them mulch and to take and to cut it down and get it out. And when they had a chipper and they all came together and they got this older woman, she lost her home and here she had all this stuff to have to clear out and she couldn't do it. But here they got this whole like swath in the retreat chipped and mulched and cleared out, which helped with, you know, when the floods and the flooding came, that was one property that wasn't going to have, you know, had less impact on the rest of the neighborhood. And for me, that took the you know the everyone organizing and then one of the local businesses brought the chipper and brought all the equipment and so those are the things i'm thinking about and and that but that is a small scale but it had a huge impact on the neighborhood and then they all i was so impressed how they all came together and connected and they needed that to kind of mourn and grieve and talk about so i think there's also just social connectedness and 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 connectedness to their local government and building that trust um with that we care about their landscapes and so you know i'm saying i think there's a lot of benefit in a lot of ways for this other above and beyond just clearing out the trees or the slash so i hope that helps too i mean i, I don't want to yeah, talk about that in this group cool. yeah because there's a lot of that happening and it's going to be you'll see um even in our county there's been a really push of the public health department and others and OB abatement about the social connectedness and getting people together. And it sometimes I find when you work on like volunteering together or doing this or that, it kind of helps. So I think, and that's not my main um, push for this. Um, I just seen it how we did this with the Black Hollow and people were, I mean, people show up in mass and to get all this stuff out and they're finding French horns and pe finding people's photo books. But they, then they got all the stuff out of, I mean, I was even picking up pieces of, of styrofoam and trash but and then that's not what this is but i'm just saying it was um i think people will show up and we could get some work done and but also just get everyone to understand more about the, the crossroads we're at so and so yeah building social yeah, I, capital i guess building social capital is, and getting even just something a small scale off the landscape would be my hope from both of these right so. well and that's a great a great point you know i think if this program moves forward um we could recommend 
you know, to the state forest service, if that's where it ends up living, that for instance, if it is some kind of grant application, um, they have criteria that sort of ask the question, you know, how do you see this pilot project or program building social capital in your area? I, I really like that. I think that's important. No, I think it is. And I think um, building trust with the forest service or the, you know, state forest service or DNOT, you know what I'm saying? It just, um, there's, there's, I think we're coming through a time where it's so easy to criticize and, but building that, that trust locally with our local and state governments and trying to build that up. Cause you know, a lot of people are still going to be viscerally. I mean, I still, when they go down to like even a 40% basal area, I got it like, Oh, all those trees. Right. Um, it, it's, it's still, even though I know intellectually, my heart hurts seeing a tree go down, you know? So, um, but intellectually, I know why we have to do all these things. So, and I see all these ribbons cut around Estes Park and some of these massive, um, you know, around the Chile camp and the, even McGregor. And, it, you know, and I know up along I-70, people just freak out with some of that stuff, but I know this is what we have to do. And um, so, I, so it's just, there was a lot of reasons and I'm hoping it, it might just be a, um, a way to um, you know, spur innovation. So, cause I know we're trying to look at this as a large area, but sometimes something small can kind of help. Um, but so that's kind of where it was, but, um, and I appreciate, I, and I'm not trying to personally counsel the meeting cause I won't be there. Um, but I just thought we don't need to have meetings to not to, to have a meeting. And since it didn't seem like there was a speaker and I, mean, I was gonna try to call him from the airport, but that might be a mess. My son's graduating from grad school. I wanna, you know, um, I haven't taken only five days off this year, so I'd like to, you know, um, and then, um, and I know Whitney can come back and it looked like dire um, Director Gibbs couldn't be a certain day, so I just thought we don't need to have meetings just to have a meeting. To keep yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think um, it helps people not feel burnt out too. It's, it's important. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today. I'm going to go tour the landfill because <laughs> we're talking about biomass and, yeah. and all these emerging technologies and the old ones about a year off, a um, year and a half off from having to close. So we're going to go look at that. And then um, I actually have a broadband discussion, legislative discussion today. And so yep, I, it's like, yeah, and I wasn't worried about 14 hours, but I was like, God, I look at my eyes. I'm like, I just need to kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's it's just that uh, there's a lot going on and uh, yeah. this whole and then I can't wait for this election cycle to get over <laughs> and right. things are so contentious here in Loveland. I live outside of the thing, but pe people are just not kind. And, oh. uh, I'm, and even within same groups of ideologically yeah. minded people, I'm just like, can we just stop and <laughs> talk about issues and every, leave everything else alone? So. Um, yeah. that's kind of why I feel a little, little weary today too. So yeah. Well, I hope you can relax this weekend. Yeah, get outside. I need to get outside. <laughs> I need to hike. I didn't hit my hundred miles though. I'm at 107 and wow. and rocky and 170 overall. But um, I need to get up. I want to get up to India and be in peaks and and then I have a bit bucket list hike bucket list hike coming up in two weeks um, outside of Colorado. So it'll be fun. So I'm cool. just I need to be um, giving myself permission to say I don't have to be connected to my devices for a few days. So oh yeah, yeah, you need that time for sure. Well, Angela, thank you so much. I hope your daughter it's a daughter, right? I forgot. Yeah, yeah, but she's I hope oh, she feels better. I think fine. I hear her like my husband and I are trading her off today. I hear her sort of chortling away in the other room. So I think it's my turn to be on duty. <laughs> well, um, you know, pink eyes never fun. And then vaccinations, those first two days, it's always, but so important. So um, yeah. I wish you, I hope you have a great weekend too. Thanks so much for everything. Thanks, we'll, see, we'll see you next week. Bye.